This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. The price of oil affects nearly everyone in terms of living costs and how much we pay for things like food and basic goods. That's why the decision by Saudi Arabia and Russia to keep in place oil production and export cuts is being felt globally, with prices of the commodity rising worldwide. Both nations have their own domestic reasons for their decisions. Some speculate that, de that a decline in relations between Saudi Arabia and the United States may be driving new alliances between the Saudi Russia and China. But how much is geopolitics really influencing Moscow and Riyadh's oil policy? Or is it simply economics and hard-nosed business seeking to make more money? We'll be asking our guests in Saudi Arabia, Russia and the US in just a moment about that and more. But first, this report from Sarah Hyrett on why oil prices are staying high. Saudi Arabia and Russia announced they'll extend cuts in oil production until the end of the year, slashing it by 1.3 million barrels a day. Fewer oil supplies mean higher prices, and that's bad news for consumers, businesses and governments looking to keep prices down. The Russian-Saudi decision on cuts follows a move by the oil producers bloc OPEC Plus to cut supply in April and then again in June. The impact of the Saudi-Russian decision has already been felt, with the price of Brent crude rising to more than $90 a barrel for the first time this year. That's an increase of more than 25% since June, when the price stood at $72. Both Saudi Arabia and Russia want higher prices for domestic reasons. The International Monetary Fund says the Saudi Kingdom needs an oil price of more than $80 a barrel to balance its budgets. Riyadh also needs to fund its ambitious Vision 2030 project to transform its economy and diversify away from its reliance on oil revenue. Austria. And Russia. Well, it needs more money to fund its war in Ukraine and help cope with severe sanctions imposed by Western nations. A higher oil price isn't welcome political news in the White House, though. While the U.S. benefits as the world's biggest oil-producing nation, when prices go up, businesses and consumers suffer. And that, of course, includes American voters just a year before a presidential election. China's economy and the risk of a downturn is a worry to all oil producers. As a huge consumer of oil, any reduction in demand because of an economic slowdown would push oil prices lower globally. And that's likely to keep Russia and Saudi Arabia on the same track, at least for now, in cutting production and keeping prices higher. Sarah Khairat for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And in Riyadh, Cornelia Meyer, CEO of the consultancy Meyer Resources. In Moscow, Chris Wafer, Chief Executive Officer at the strategic business firm Macro Advisory. And in Houston, Texas, Andrew Lipow, President of Lipow Oil Associates. That's a company that specializes in oil trade. A very warm welcome to all of you. Andrew, let's start with you. Has this announcement, this limit of the amount of oil available on the market, to the end of the year come as a surprise? I think it was a surprise to the market that the cuts were extended through the end of the year where the mm. market expected it to go month by month. And as a result, as world oil inventories continued to decline, we're seeing oil prices rally, especially in the face of increasing demand. And so, Cornelia, you are in Saudi, and I know that you know uh, the Saudi oil minister. Perhaps you can shed some light for us on why the Saudis are extending these cuts. Well, I cannot speak for any minister, so, so they're just up front. But if I look at the decision, and I will also look at the uh, most recent OPEC decisions, this is not this is less politics. OPEC doesn't really do that much politics. It's also a reflection of the worry 
of the global economy. We have seen China not really getting out of the doldrums from the from the zero COVID policy. So that's uh, you know, we China is a bit of a sick man. Europe has a war going on, and you look especially at Germany, which is not doing well at all. So there is a real concern of where the global economy is headed. Um, yes, it's true. At the same time, we have um, global oil um, um, consumption at an all-time high of 103 million barrels a day. But still, it's all seen as quite tenuous. So I think it's also a matter of being, from an OPEC perspective, it's also a matter of being prudent and being ready to, to, to for what happens if the economy really doesn't do too well. You can always it's always easier to put the tap on than mm. to than to than to close it. Uh, Andrew, do you accept that prudency? I mean the Saudis have said that they are willing to review it month by month and can increase production uh, production if necessary. Well, I do agree because we've seen over the last year Saudi Arabia has taken proactive and preemptive steps in order to, in their words, produce oil market stability. And they may be having great insight into the demand in China due to their uh, joint venture refineries and seeing the demand from the purchasers in that country. And as a result, they don't want to see a repeat of what we have seen in the past where the world goes into a recession, oil demand plummets, as well as the price, while the Saudis are worried about their domestic uh, spending. Chris, let's bring you in, because Russia does appear to be standing firm with Saudi on this, limiting its exports of oil onto the market. What does it get out of it? Well, it's, uh, for Russia, it is a case of hard-nosed economics uh, on a short-term and a longer-term perspective. Obviously, the short-term, uh, short to medium-term perspective is that Russia needs the money to fund the budget, which is now, of course, funding the, the military as well as uh, domestic social stability. Uh, so it, it obviously wants to earn as much money as, as, as possible over the medium term. And the actions of OPEC, particularly the actions of Saudi Arabia, have helped Russia Kind of boost its income. If you if you go back to the earlier this year when the oil price was a bit soft, uh, Russia was having to sell its oil heavily discounted. Uh, you know, 30, 40 percent discount on the on the Brent price. Uh, it was what it it was using to gain markets in India and China. But since uh, Saudi in particular has announced these uh, big cuts and they've extended them, and Russia is participating. To a smaller extent, uh, 300,000 barrels uh, a day to, to the end of the year, but it has allowed Russia to boost uh, its oil, uh, the oil price that it gets uh, for exports. So now we heard from the Ministry of Finance just recently that Russia is earning an average of $75 per barrel, whereas it was down to as low as 40 earlier in the year. That means the budget is now recovering. And financially, uh, Russia is is now kind of in a much safer place than it was. Mm. And then finally, longer term, and I think this is obviously, I hear this a lot in travels in the Middle East and OPEC countries as well. Longer term, uh, it, it, all of this is against the backdrop where, where the constant message from the West in particular is that they are moving as fast as possible away from hydrocarbons towards renewable and other sources. So essentially, the message to the oil producers from the big kind of Western markets is that there's a time limit on when, how much longer we will want your oil or gas and we willing to pay for it. So producers now also need to earn a lot of money over say the next 10 years to use that money to create new economic drivers for the longer term. So I think there's kind of both short and medium term factors when it comes to this okay. decision to keep the oil price up towards $100 Brent. Cornelia, is that, is that the situation that you're finding there in Saudi, that producers are well, keen to keep the price high for as long as possible, seeing it as a finite resource? Well, first of all, I mean, when you see OPEC actions, OPEC actions, OPEC is always very clear we are not that they're not dealing with with, with um, price per se, mm. they're dealing mm. with keeping the market adequately um, supplied. And I think, but I think there is something in that, that, you know, the, the OECD countries say we want to move away from oil and 
and uh, we want to have internal combustion engines on the streets out by 2035 and all of those things. But mind you, in the emerging world, in Africa, in South Asia, where, we'll ha where we will have 2 billion people more by the end of 2050, um, we will have, they will still need oil, you know, we need energy, we need all sources of energy. So it's not just about getting oil out, it's about getting CO2 out. And there you also have carbon removal technology. So we need to have a broader viewpoint. But there is certainly something in what, um, what, what our colleague just said. And in Saudi Arabia, I mean, they have got huge projects going on. You've got Vision 30, you've got this whole city, Neon, being built in the desert. Something's got to fund that. Yes, something's got to fund that, but there's also interest from from, from investment um, from from investors from from abroad. So something's got to fund that, but it's less about funding that. I mean, th those projects will be funded. They're they're, they're solid. They're sound. But it's also it's it's really when we when we talk about oil, yes, obviously anybody would like the the key input to one's budget, which in the case of Saudi is oil, to be as high as possible. That's true. But I don't think this is about funding. I don't really think this is about funding um, Vision 2030. This is really a, about them, you know, keeping the market ad adequately supplied and thinking ahead of what what the downside in the economy can be. Because as I said, um, the Saudis are very capable of um, putting up the putting on the tap because they have a, they have you know they have a huge production capacity. So um, you know there are four million barrels a day more in there that they can put on if they choose to do so. Andrew, do you agree with that? Do you agree that Saudi, Saudi's moves are not so much about the money, more about supporting the stability and the balance of oil markets? Does the U.S. see it that way? Well, I don't think the U.S. sees it that way. In fact, I think that the, the Saudis are quite concerned about the revenues. And in fact, we see that OPEC, with their monthly demand forecasts, are actually the most optimistic on increasing demand uh, more than the International Energy Agency forecast of 2.2 million barrels a day of growth this year. So we see that OPEC, while quite optimistic on the demand side, is, is more than happy to reduce the supplies to the market. What I would say is Saudi Arabia is really shouldering the burden of these supply cuts at the same time that we see increased production from Iran, Libya, and Venezuela, who are not bound by the OPEC plus quotas. What impact, though, does it have on the economy? Because the Saudi output is such a huge percentage of the global oil market. I shouldn't imagine it's buffered too much by the other, other oil producing countries that you just mentioned. So what impact does these, do these cuts from Saudi and Russia have, or from Saudi particularly, have on the U.S. economy? Well, certainly the consumer is paying more for gasoline, and that, of course, is a highlight for the Biden administration. But a more serious issue is that the price of diesel is rising dramatically, and that's a hidden tax on the consumer for all the goods and services that they're purchasing, whether it's at the store or for home delivery. And that not only affects us here in the United States, but elsewhere in Europe, where they're more dependent on diesel and diesel prices, as well as the rest of the world. Uh, <laughs> what sauce did you put on? Oh, that's hot, bro. <laughs> Chris, do you think that the Saudis are aligning themselves more with Russia and against the US on this particular issue. Is it a message to the US? Well, no, I, I wouldn't read it as an anti-US move by, 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 say, Saudi. But, but for sure, there we can see greater kind of political and also investment and trade engagement between Saudi and, and Russia. But also the, the Saudis are, and other Emirates, uh, other countries in the Gulf, such as the Emirates and, and Qatar, are also much more active in terms of developing trade and investment kind of looking east and looking north. So we see significant investments in, in Central Asia, 
from from countries in in the Gulf. Uh, obviously, we see engagement uh, with 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 China and with India. Uh, so it, it's part of that diversification. I would not read it as an anti-U.S. move uh, for sure. That kind of what used to be a very close political relationship between Saudi and Washington is now gone. But it's gone because Saudi is diversifying and is looking to, you know, broaden its relationship and its trade rather than say we're turning against the West and we're going to East. I think I see it more as diversification. And obviously now Saudi, along with the Emirates, will uh, and Iran will join the BRICS. The grouping from from January, we've yet to see how does this develop, how does BRICS, you know, de develop beyond what it has been, which has just been a talking shop, but now it can get bigger with Saudi and the Emirates. And also even last week, just one final point, we, we heard the first ever uh, cargo rail or, or train uh, uh, between um, Russia and Saudi Arabia uh, kind of left Russia and will arrive in Saudi Arabia kind of in the next couple of days. This is the first ever direct kind of trade route between Russia and Saudi, and, and the, it will, of course, go through Iran and Central Asia. But the uh, the intention from both sides when the, when the train left Russia was that this is going to become a much bigger trade route in the f future between the two countries. But much more about diversification, as I would see it, rather than a uh, mm. move away from the West towards the East. But Moscow surely would be very happy to jump on board with this policy if it was seen to be hurting the US, to be hurting Joe Biden. Yeah, I, even I wouldn't read too much into that kind of anti kind of US stance in, in Moscow. For sure, we're all aware of the politics and NATO mm. and, and Moscow's view of that. But no, when, when you talk to ministers and you talk to other other officials, it, it's this is not about, you know, let's hurt the US and let's, you know, grab Saudi out of the Western camp and bring it into, you know, kind of the, the, the Russia China camp. No, you don't hear that. This is uh, it, really the dialogue is all about how can we create new markets, new trade partnerships, new co-investment? And clearly that means bringing in not just India and some African nations, but also the Gulf, the rich Gulf states as well. And as Moscow sees it, there is a lot of kind of commonality in the long-term interests of countries like Saudi, the Emirates and Russia, because they are all currently very dependent on hydrocarbons. Uh, they are all looking at the long-term future of diversification. Uh, and as uh, Moscow's position is that, therefore, th there, it makes sense for mm. countries to cooperate. But not in the, I do not hear anybody saying this is an anti-Europe, anti-West move. It's more about how can we work together kind of to create a better trade and investment partnership long-term. It's not political as far as I can okay. see. OK, let's uh, bring Andrew in on that and see if he agrees. Andrew, is the feeling, is the sentiment there in the US that this is not political, that they shouldn't read anything into it? It's purely economics. Well, I do think from the Saudi perspective, it, quite a bit of it is economic. And clearly, the US is already producing nearly 13 million barrels a day of crude oil and exporting 4 million barrels a day of that. So we really have less dependence on Saudi Arabia and the Middle East for our oil supplies. In addition, the United States continues to increase its LNG exports. Where I do see a lot of politics is that Europe is really divorcing itself from Russian energy supplies. The U.S. is coming in to fill some of that gap. And the U.S. is looking at producers in the Middle East to fill the rest of that gap that's made by the shortfall of Russian oil sales into Europe. But how concerned should Biden be as the election year uh, uh, approaches pretty rapidly and prices at the petrol pump, they're approaching $4 a gallon, aren't they? And that is a politically sensitive threshold. Surely, what can Biden do at this stage to keep the prices as low as possible? Well, there's very little that Biden can do in the short term. We just saw they canceled the seven remaining leases in the Alaska National Wildlife Reserve. So that is disheartening to the oil industry. The oil industry needs much more certainty for their long-term planning of drilling uh, to produce more oil here in the United States. But what you have seen the Biden administration do is start talking to Venezuela and Iran, I think, with the aim of getting more oil production to the market, which tempers any increases in oil prices. Clearly, Iran has just announced that they're producing well over 3 million barrels a day of oil. 
And we're seeing, once again, the U.S. talk to Venezuela about having free and fair elections in order to relieve the sanctions on that country. Claudia, it's a real tightrope, isn't it, that Saudi's walking. If the oil price gets too high, inflation increases, therefore banks have to bring um, up interest rates and then the economy slows and the, the demand drops back down. They'll be having to keep a very close eye on the impact that these price hikes have. I think, yes, they do. One does have to have a quite uh, tight thing. And it's especially, you know, it's the CPI. It's not the core inflation. It's the CPI that is going to go up. And that worries, obviously, um, central bank governors around, uh, around the world. So there's a, there's a tightrope because a, a, a good um, global economy means more demand for oil. A mm. bad a global economy means less demand for oil. You know, if you look at it from the standpoint of the Middle Eastern oil producers, their real, their biggest customers are India and China. So there's, for a long time, the, 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 the trade flows, the oil flows have more gone east than they have gone west. Now, with the Russian with the Russian sanctions, more of it goes to Europe again. But that's that's another that's another part. But you always will try to be close. You always will try to watch your market closely, and that's why again, where we come into looking at what China is doing and where the Chinese economy is going. Because if you're largest client, if you don't know where that is going economically, you're going to be prudent. Chris, where is the Chinese economy going? Is it recovering or is it still stagnating? It's, it's stagnating. And in fact, I think one of the reasons perhaps why, why Saudi and Russia have uh, you know, made this statement to, of uh, the cuts extending to year end rather than month by month, uh, as, as was mentioned was previously, is because there is a real concern that the Chinese could have some uh, significant economic problems uh, by the end of this year or into next year. And specifically, that's related to the real estate market, the amount of lending in the real estate market, the potentially the amount of, of bad loans uh, and, and defaults in, in, in the real estate market. It's something that the government has turned a blind eye to, has, has allowed to develop. And you can see all the signs of a real estate bubble uh, in, in China. And if it's not handled properly, then you could have a major problem in the Chinese economy next year. And I think that's also partly perhaps why, why OPEC Russia are, are taking this line uh, in, term, in terms of cut, because you cannot at all be sure that the Chinese economy will either remain stable or, or grow. There, there's a real danger of, uh, of, of a crisis in the Chinese economy because of real estate. Uh, one very last a quick point, if I, if I may, the, the, to, uh, the actions by, by uh, Saudi, by, by OPEC, have actually, of course, uh, weakened to a large extent the, the impact of sanctions uh, on Russia and Iran, because now you have a situation where, uh, as I mentioned, Russia is now selling its oil for an average of $75 per barrel, according to the finance ministry. Uh, whereas the price cap imposed by the G7 and EU uh, was $60. Uh, but the EU and G7 have, uh, have delayed any review uh, of the price cap, uh, which has been called for by some countries, because they, do, because they need the oil. They need the oil in the market, and they're not going to do anything that would further tighten the oil market and drive prices higher. And as our colleague in Houston mentioned, uh, the Iranians are now very openly talking about uh, boosting production uh, over 3 million, and they have a hard target of 3.8 million uh, with, by, within six months. And it means their exports are also rising, and everybody knows it. But again, it's not causing any, there, there's mm. no complaints from Washington, et cetera, because of what Saudi has, and OPEC has done means that the market needs both Russian and Iranian oil. Um, that's, that's true, isn't it, Andrew? We haven't seen any big outcry from Washington over this move because it's very hard to balance geopolitics and economics. Well, I think that's exactly right. The administration wants to see lower gasoline and diesel prices. And if we're not going to be producing that much more crude oil here in the United States, you can't simply sanction everybody and expect that the oil... Uh, supply goes down and prices remain stable. And as a result, we've taken this 
um, you know, look the other way philosophy on what's happening with Iran. And we're uh, seeing the same thing happen as the Russian oil sales exceed the price cap. Not much action has been taken against the vessel owners or financing of those cargoes because the administration knows they don't want a supply disruption as we potentially experienced when Russia had invaded the Ukraine back in 2022. Looking for a great deal on your hotel? Use Kayak to compare prices. Search now on Kayak. Cornelia, just to, to, to look at the broader picture as we wrap up the show, do high oil prices risk a global economic recovery? Well, high oil prices will have an impact on, on, on the CPI, on the, on, on, on the headline inflation rate. And that will obviously then have an impact as central banks' mandate is to keep um, inflation at 2 percent, will have an impact on interest rates, which then will have an imp imp impact on, you know, how quickly economies can grow. So in that sense, yes, they do have, a, they do have an impact. And that is certainly on the radar screen of Saudi Arabia but also of, of, of OPEC. So as you said earlier, it's a tightrope, you know, how much does one have to do in order to preempt if there should, should there be a recession in China? And um, how much oil does one have to release not to have too much of an inflationary um, impact um, on the global economy? So yes, it, it, does, have, it does have an impact um, but as I said before, you know, the, 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 the spare capacity is there to mm. release more oil should it be required. But the key is that, that Saudi's in charge, isn't it? Well, so it, OPEC is, uh, you need to have unanimous decisions to move anywhere, but Saudi is certainly the big brother and Saudi and, and Russia is the big brother for the non-OPEC um, um, group in this OPEC plus um, arrangement. Um, but Saudi certainly, uh, Saudi is the is the largest crude exporter. The U.S., by the way, is the largest um, um, crude producer. But um, Saudi is the largest crude exporter. So yes, certainly, if you are the if you are the three hundred pound pound gorilla in a mm. in a in a room of smaller countries, of course, you will have a big say. And uh, Andrew, just last word to you: that Does then the success of Bidenomics of Joe Biden's economic policy depend largely on Saudi? Well, it does to the extent that Bidenomics depends on affordable energy prices. And what the market is concerned about is that if it sees that world inventories are declining, the market may go up faster than Saudi Arabia is willing to open up the taps and you can have a mismatch in timing that, of course, creates a political discussion over here about higher prices as gasoline mm. prices react very quickly to increases in crude oil prices at the consumer level. Such an interesting discussion that we've had here today on Inside Story. Many thanks to all our guests for joining us, Cornelia Meyer, Chris Weaver and Andrew Lippau. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, it's bye for now.